Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. I'd like to welcome and thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm Jill Adams from the Waterford Public Library here in Waterford, Connecticut. First, I'd like to welcome all my colleagues across the state who joined me in uh, put a, pulling together this tiny home program. There's 16 libraries that are represented this evening and we've all worked to publicize and get the word out and see if we can start uh, tiny home communities here in Connecticut. So thank you all. Um, I cannot, I don't have the time to read off all 16 names, but you're all here. And thank you so much for supporting um, me in this effort. I'm very welcome, very pleased to welcome Lindsay Wood, CEO of Experience Tiny Homes, which is on a mission to develop a thousand tiny homes as affordable houses in Southern California. In August of 2017, Lindsay and her husband, Eric, had their tiny home epiphany. Within a couple of years, their new tiny home was completed. And next thing they knew, they were on the road giving talks about their tiny home experience. With that in mind, they created the not-for-profit Experience Tiny Homes to educate and empower people dreaming of going tiny to know exactly what choices to make who to trust and what steps to take on their journey of owning their own dream tiny home. Lindsay has been featured in articles by Inman Media, Inman Media Business Insider, Mercury News, Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, Tiny East, Bay Times, Common Ground, and many others. Our second speaker this evening is Dan Fitzpatrick president of the Tiny Home Industry Association and director of government relations for both the Tiny Home Industry Association and the American Tiny House Association. Dan has made presentations to cities and counties throughout the West Coast on the opportunities for tiny houses and movable tiny houses as a means to meet the ever growing need for affordable and sustainable housing. Dan has over 48 years of broad executive level management and administrative leadership experience in both public and private sector organizations. Because of his government and developer experience, he's been working with California local governments to amend their planning and zoning codes to permit movable tiny houses as accessory dweller units, also known as ADUs. We extend a big thank you to Lindsay and Dan for speaking with us this evening and we so much appreciate it and we welcome them both. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jill. Hi, Dan. Hi, everybody. Hi, Lindsay. In Zoom land there in Connecticut and around the country. We've just tracked some people. If you're just joining now, we've got people from all over the country, um, from California to Connecticut to Michigan. Uh, to Minnesota, and it's just great to be here. And we also see a number of people have been tracking and following different shows. And um, I put in the chat, uh, make sure to put in, to select panelists and attendees so you can see the chat, uh, various ways to find me and also Dan there on Facebook. And Dan, do you want to uh, say hello as well? No, <laughs> no, let's, um... I'll introduce myself when we start the uh, presentation. All right, let's go right to it. Let me make sure that is ready to go and I will share my screen. Here we go. Okay, why is Tiny such a big idea? I love that. Jill came up with that great name and it is a big idea. 
And this is both myself, uh, Lindsay Wood with Experience Tiny Homes, also a board member of the Tiny Home Industry Association, that which connects both Dan and I, and Dan is the president of Thea. Our emails are gonna be at, on the bottom of most pages. So uh, we will also, we are available. If something passes you by or a question doesn't get answered by any means, feel free to reach out to us. Let's see here. Okay. And so Dan, I gave us a little bio. This is a new slide for us. Well, great. The, uh, I've been involved in the Tiny Home Industry Association for approximately six years. And uh, the reason I'm involved is not because I aspire to live in a tiny home, uh, but as a former city manager and county administrator, and certainly also as a developer, I know one of the most difficult things it is to provide uh, to our community is affordable housing and tiny homes, whether they're built on a foundation or on wheels, uh, are certainly available uh, uh, as uh, privately developed uh, affordable housing, almost affordable housing by definition, and, uh, and they're sustainable. So I've been working with uh, communities around uh, the country, especially here in my a home state of California to legalize tiny homes as uh, accessory uh, dwelling units and also standalone units on, on property throughout the uh, state. Uh, again, my background is uh, 30 some years as a uh, in the public sector, uh, doing everything from the being the assistant city manager in Las Vegas, one of the fastest growing cities in the country to uh, county administrator in Fresno over here in uh, California. So um, I've been very pleased to have the ability to work with uh, my former counterparts around the country for uh, uh, tiny homes, and it's on a national level now. I work with uh, Atlanta, Florida, Raleigh, North Carolina, Tampa, Florida, the states of Maine, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, uh, Oregon, Washington, um, to assist in amending laws to make uh, the states and local governments uh, tiny friendly. So that's a little bit about my background and how I got involved in the tiny home industry. Thank you, Dan. And this is me. I'm also, as I mentioned, on the board of the Tiny Home Industry Association. And I not only aspire to live in a tiny home, but I do live in a tiny home. In fact, this is my background that I still have to work on. Uh, we just moved back in our home after being out of it for a year because of COVID. Um, you know, I know COVID's kind of come in and rattled a lot of things around um, in business, personal life. But we just moved. Actually, that's a picture of me and my husband moving back into our tiny home and then driving it down to San Diego, where we are currently at. Um, I'm also, as I mentioned, um, or Joe mentioned, CEO of Experience Tiny Homes. We really work with helping people along their tiny home journey because ours was such an interesting one uh, with our builder going out of business in the middle of the build and us taking over or rescuing our tiny home and having to deal with a surprise DIY. Um, from that, we've really just been working. Uh, we've been in our tiny home for, I would say three years after we actually physically moved into it, traveled uh, to 12 different festivals 6,000 miles around the country. Not a common thing for tiny home owners, but because it was our business and because we wanted to travel, that's what we did. So uh, now we're really excited to be down here in San Diego. And as my friends asked me, is this your permanent place? I'm like, our home's on wheels. The reason why we bought it is so that we could move it. And we absolutely do that, but we just don't do it weekly or monthly. Now we're getting a little bit more settled in the areas that we're in. And so, Dan. Well, one of the, uh, I like to say that the tiny house movement is uh, back to the future. I'm old enough to remember that uh, the average household size 50 years ago was mom and dad and three kids. I grew up in the 1950s. And the average size of a house in the 1950s was 1,000 square feet. Again, so the the average size of the house now is about 2,200 square feet, but the number of people per dwelling unit has dropped. So 
we've doubled the size and we've dropped the number of people living in the house. Uh, if you took uh, my mom and dad and three kids and a thousand square foot house, that's all of us living in a tiny house. So uh, one of the interesting points about who is buying tiny homes, a lot of folks think it's it's the young folks, it's millennials. Well, believe it or not, the a good demographic is a 55 year old uh, person and uh, over 50% of them, 60% of the buyers are women. It's basically uh, baby boomers that are downsizing because uh, you know, just like myself and my wife, uh, we're rattling around in a 3,500 square foot house because the kids have left and we're ready to uh, downsize into something uh, smaller. Um, the uh, I'd like uh, you'll hear when you talk to some politicians or city leaders that they'll say, oh, the tiny house movement or small houses, that's just a fad. Well, it's really not a fad. Look at the demographics. The demographics are that between the millennials and the Gen Z's and us baby boomers is that uh, right now over 50 percent of the population is single family in single family units are just one people, one person in these households. And uh, we, unfortunately, what we're building are McMansions, not housing to support uh, the demographics for today. People don't need 3,000 square feet or 2,000 square feet uh, if they're single or just a, a couple. Uh, those are the demographics. Uh, again, the millennials are marrying uh, later in life, having children later in life. And so uh, the demographics are there to support uh, tiny homes or smaller homes, bungalows, cottages, uh, like they've never uh, been before. And as a representative of the Gen X crew, I will say I'm just under that 55 at 50, 50 years old. Actually, sorry, 51. I forgot that. <laughs> uh, you know, for us, it's an opportunity to actually have home ownership. That was our biggest um, realization as we just did not want to become burdened with the kind of type of debt in the area we were living in, uh, namely, you know, the coastal area of, of California, you're looking at, you know, minimum in the 700,000 to a million dollars. So we just opted for something different. So Dan, I put this slide in here just to kind of give us a little bit understanding of what is an ADU. A lot of uh, around the country, each state, each community is different on whether they allow uh, backyard cottages or uh, what we refer to as accessory uh, dwelling units. Um, many states uh, may permit them, but it's a community by community uh, basis. And unfortunately, many, many of the states, especially back east, are not overly friendly to having uh, units in backyards uh, versus here in California, it's required by law. You you have a right to have a unit in the backyard. So you're seeing many, many uh, communities here uh, building second units uh, in the backyard. Many of them are tiny. They're 150 square feet up to 400 square feet, and some of them get uh, uh, larger. You're allowed to go up to 1,200 uh, square feet. Uh, so that's... Uh, an important component of if you want to go uh, have tiny homes and so forth, many times, especially like there in Connecticut and Massachusetts and other New England states, you first have to get your community to allow you to build a unit in the backyard and then uh, allow uh, get permits uh, to allow uh, tiny homes uh, to be in the backyard. And one thing to add in this market in the in the California market, we have seen the mentality of not in my backyard, what will that do to my housing prices, you name it. In reality, <laughs> it's going to increase your property value, because you're actually adding another whole living unit. So a lot of that not in my backyard really soon got shifted. And now there's there's um, real estate agents that you know, once had maybe one or two people interested in an ADU in the backyard. Now with more than 50% of a real estate um, buyer is actually interested with something in the backyard for an office, for a loved one, for a rental unit, just giving that flexibility um, for the lifetime of that home. 
a lot of uh, there's a lot of questions about what is a tiny home, and uh, the good news is is the new uh, 2018 International Building Code actually defines it. It's a unit that's less than 400 square feet. So you have uh, basically, I, I like to say, three different types of um, tiny homes. You can have a tiny home that is built on wheels that you can move around like Lindsay's unit, or you can have a tiny house that's built on a foundation that's permanent and affixed to the property. And, uh, and a number of communities, there's a number of these in some of the bigger urban areas here in California, where they have tiny home modules that get stacked into high rise configurations. Uh, so generally, if you have a move, movable tiny house, they're generally eight and a half feet wide. Um, very seldom do they go over 10 feet wide. They're usually less than 40 feet long and they don't go above, they're no taller than 13 feet, six inches, because that's the national limit for traveling like the interstate highways. And, uh, and um, I know how low a lot of those tunnels and bridges and overpasses are back east. You'd lose your uh, roof real quick. Uh, so uh, the units cannot go over 13 feet, five inches or six inches uh, in, um, uh, nationally. What is a movable tiny house? Uh, we'll go through a little definition here. Here's some different examples that you can uh, design almost any types of, uh, of, of units. Next slide. And first, first thing I tell people is a movable tiny house is not your conventional travel trailer. Uh, a lot of people, if you say we want to uh, permit movable tiny houses, they have visions of RVs going in backyards. And the first thing you have to do is say, no, they're not traditional uh, uh, trailers or fifth wheelers or motor homes. And there's a hundred ways I've written ordinances that allow movable tiny houses, but are written in such a way that they specifically prohibit what you see on the screen here. Basically, tiny homes are built to resemble a, a typical cottage or bungalow. The only difference is, is basically it's a stick built house, a house that you would build on a foundation, but the foundation just happens to be a carrier that has wheels, that it supports the weight. Uh, most, most tiny homes are under 15,000 uh, know, pounds, Un unlike Lindsay's. Lindsay's is uh, what, 100 tons or something? 20,000, yes. <laughs> yes, no, it's a, it's a big unit. But you can see the, uh, for example, the one in the upper left-hand corner is a tiny home uh, that's built. And that currently sits on the coast overlooking the beautiful city of Santa Cruz on the Santa Cruz Harbor. Absolutely beautiful, uh, beautiful unit. And a number of these units are, are in people's uh, uh, backyards or in uh, communities uh, throughout uh, the country. And I want to point out really quickly, um, one of the things that's so unique with tiny homes, see the different roof lines with that? It's in a very small space. This is a very nice luxury tiny home, mostly because of obviously what's inside, but also the different roof line. You know, there's your typical gable roof, gable roof, and then these are dormers that stick out. So it really puts it differently than I've been looking at a lot of um, what we used to call mobile homes, now called manufactured homes they did not get into unique roof designs, but that's really where you can start setting apart the tiny home with this um, standing seam roof and different roof line structure. It also you know, serves a purpose inside the tiny home as well. And remember, you have to be creative with your roof lines because you can't go above 13 feet, six inches. So you have to be very, very clever on how you design uh, the space so your loft uh, you have enough room to sleep up in your sleeping loft. Anyway, what I like to point out to your city and state officials is that uh, movable tiny homes are built just like any other home. Uh, they have two by fours, uh, uh, you know, house wrap, insulation, um, and they meet uh, basic, you know, basic uh, minimum uh, uh, building codes. In fact, uh, most, I would say 99% of commercially built 
movable tiny homes are built much higher standard than you would see in a uh, manufactured house that's built in accordance with HUD uh, rules and regulations. These things are uh, very well built. To compare a movable tiny house to a conventional RV is like comparing a Sherman tank to a Volkswagen. I mean, they're just totally different animals. Actually, I have an interesting story. We were recently in an RV park right after a, a festival and a gentleman was in his RV and then we were in our tiny home right next to each other. We had him over and he couldn't imagine how much quieter our home was when we closed the door because there was a freeway going right by us. It was Highway 5. Um, and we closed the door and you could somewhat hear it, but he could definitely hear it in his RV. So just to give you a little idea, insulation, weight of home, all of that goes into, um, as you can see here in the build. The benefits of a tiny home are um, uh, things that are important to both the community as well as the user. First of all, the community needs affordable housing and the user needs affordable housing. These tiny homes be, meet that as well as they're energy efficient and they take a, a very small amount of water and a very small sewer uh, consumption. Uh, things that are all important to communities around the country, especially, especially here in the West when we're having a major uh, drought issues is uh, a sustainable, you know, living and uh, uh, low use of water and uh, sewer is uh, very important. Next item. Uh, they're also very easy to lo uh, locate, hook up, and maintain. And also, these are very are are perfect for infill. Uh, that you have increased density, but without sprawl. And this is important for any, any city or county around the, the country is as your population increases, is you really have only two choices. You either increase density or you rape and pillage the countryside. I mean, that's your only two, you know, only choices. And uh, again, speaking as a city manager or a county administrator, having folks build units within a area that already has housing cuts our cost dramatically because we're already paying for police, fire, roads, water, sewer. They're already there. You're just getting more bang for the buck for your taxpayer dollars to increase uh, a density, especially by allowing units like these to go into backyards. And what's also very important, the last item here is you can, you can provide, a community can provide uh, affordable housing without one penny of taxpayer, you know, subsidy. I mean, you can buy a really nice tiny house unit for and get it placed for under 120,000, under 100,000 in most cases, put it in the backyard. And uh, that is much, much cheaper than uh, what cities are paying and subsidizing uh, developers to build quote unquote affordable housing. I think yeah. we have a slide later on to explain that. And we, you know, Lewis just mentioned in the comments, a really good point to explain to city managers, can we have that script? So, you know, this is um, more of a different version of our presentation, but Dan gives a very specific version uh, directly to elected officials uh, that speaks to that. Um, and yeah, so I, I do, I think after researching, after hearing what Dan shared, I've done the research, it's $480,000 per door unit that a city or a county will have to pay towards affordable housing. So I mean, what, what ba basically Lindsay's talking about is if I, as a developer, build a typical housing unit, like an apartment complex, in expensive places, like I'm sure Connecticut has very expensive places, that's certainly California, to build that unit will cost me a half million dollars. Well, to rent it out to affordable housing, I got to get it subsidized down to make believe it was only costing me a hundred thousand, right? Well, that means the taxpayer is throwing in anywhere from 300 to $400,000 per door, per unit to bring, bring forward affordable housing. So you basically have two choices. 
you either empower the private sector by allowing tiny homes and get affordable housing built by the private sector for free, or you spend billions of dollars of taxpayer money to subsidize the development community to build it. That's your choices. Yeah. Next. Okay, we have, again, there's two different types of uh, housing. There's the stick built, I, you know, they're the units that are built on foundations and then the movable. Uh, Connecticut, I believe, has approved the International Residential Code for uh, stick built or foundation built housing. So you can build tiny homes in Connecticut under 400 square feet and build them with lofts and other criteria that was not allowed in previous building codes. Uh, you know, like it, it, it permits uh, ladders to the lofts, uh, stairways with steeper uh, steps, and also it cuts down the required headroom. Uh, for example, the headroom under the loft that you see here would be probably six and a half feet in order to give 36 inches of headroom up in the loft. So that's, if you build uh, in accordance to the International Residential Code uh, 2018, that is inclusive of Appendix Q. Appendix Q is uh, the tiny friendly version for units built under 400 square feet is you can build tiny homes all day, every day, uh, if, if they're foundation based, not um, um, on wheels based. Now, what's also nice about the movable tiny houses is they can be built in any way to meet the needs of the community. Uh, Jill was mentioning to us earlier on about how a number of communities in Connecticut and so forth is they want the uh, accessory dwelling units or units to match uh, the neighborhood. Well, that's simple. With a movable tiny house, you're buying it out of the factory. You just tell them what siding you want put on it or what kind of roof line. Uh, and what paint to put on it to match uh, the neighborhood. You don't necessarily want a modern type house in the backyard on a historic, historic Victorian or craftsman style, uh, you know, neighborhood. Uh, so there, it's very easy to uh, change out uh, the exterior on these units. And also you can, uh, design your interior to meet uh, your particular needs that uh, for your categories of living, sleeping, cooking, sanitation. Now, those are key words. Uh, every state in the union defines a dwelling unit as a place that for living, sleeping, cooking, and sanitation. In other words, it has to have a bathroom, has to have a kitchen, has to have cooking, you know, facilities, has to have a toilet, sanitation facilities. And uh, that's, you know, a true tiny house, movable tiny house or on uh, foundation uh, meets all of those uh, criteria. It's just built in a smaller space. And this interesting point on um, when people may think of tiny homes as it is a really big opportunity for, you know, housing those that are not housed Oftentimes a tiny home village that is created will be more of a shelter where it's more of a bed with electricity and light, but it won't necessarily have a kitchen or a bathroom and that will be done in more communal services. And then there'll be wraparound services as well, especially for mental health or on, you know, any drug addiction programs, you name it. So just to kind of create that clarity, uh, those are usually two different worlds, but it does kind of end up getting overlapped. Yeah, what, what Lindsay's saying is basically is, is these, what you're seeing there are, are tiny homes. Key word is homes. You'll see these tiny shelters, which don't have bathrooms and cooking facilities. That's all they are. They're bedrooms as shelters, and they're not a tiny home. Totally different product. Yep. Um, what's important to make sure, and, uh, and certainly city uh, folks and uh, state of officials uh, want to make sure that the units that, uh, if they are permitted within the city, uh, are certified, that they're inspected and meet basic 
uh, code requirements. So any of you thinking of uh, buying uh, or building yourself a tiny home, make sure you build it in accordance with the appropriate code and that you get a, that it's certified by an independent third party inspector that at the end of the day, you get a sticker put on the unit that says you meet these codes. Uh, in fact, many of your um, mobile home parks or campgrounds, uh, if you're traveling with them, won't let you even in your campground, in those campgrounds, unless you have such a sticker. So it's it's not, you know, for your do-it-yourselfers, you're just not gonna go out and get an old boat trailer and build something on top of it and think you have a unit that's going to be accepted any place. It has to be built in accordance with codes and it has to be independently certified. Uh, the good news is there are several firms nationally that will work with the do-it-yourselfers. So at the end of the day, you'll end up with a certified uh, dwelling unit. It's also good for resale, just to let someone know, you know, who know, who's to know what's behind the wall. We had quite an experience with our builder going out of business didn't run the electrical system correctly. Fortunately, they hadn't wrapped up the walls because they were obviously out of business in the middle of our build, but we were able to go back in with a solar electrician and safely fix that electrical wiring, which is one of the big causes of fires in a home is electricity or you know improper wiring. So that's super important to, to really have someone confirm that what you've built or what another company built is done to a certain standard. Now, the next two slides are my favorite slides, especially when I'm talking to elected officials or city staff. I point out that I, I first say is, aren't these beautiful cottages? Wouldn't you love to have these uh, within your city? Certainly these would look nice in the backyards of many of your uh, uh, community uh, residential lots. And most, most of the time I have city council mayor, mayors all nodding their heads. Oh yeah, they're nice, we like that. Then I go to the next slide. I said, well, unfortunately you can't have these because these have wheels on it. These are not legal. Same, exact same unit, that's legal. This is not legal. It's basically a difference without any substance. And it's simply because it's that the minute you put wheels on it, someone wants to put it in another, another silo uh, that these are RVs and uh, they're different from a stick built house. Well, there's no difference other than one's on a chassis and the other one's on a foundation. They're built exactly the same. You can take these wheels off and put them on piers and you would not know the difference between them and a stick built house. Uh, many of the uh, pictures you'll see uh, later on in this presentation, uh, you, you could not tell which ones were tiny houses on wheels and which ones were tiny houses built on uh, foundations. But this is a great slide to use when you're talking to elected officials because uh, they're very pragmatic. They look at staff and going, wait a minute, what's the difference between these two, you know, <laughs> two units other than I on one, I was able to Photoshop out the wheels because they're the same unit. I always tell people my tiny home is RV from the trailer down and tiny home from the trailer up. And this is where, as Dan mentions, it kind of makes those elected officials a little crazy because just, you know, we're, we're disrupting the way things have been done, but that's okay. That's our job. Well, the uh, a number of things that you need to look at, and there's a lot of options available to uh, uh, your state or local governments is that for, um, you could uh, put tiny homes or removal tiny homes in existing existingly zoned RV or mobile home parks and upgrade them to be more compatible to a tiny home village versus, you know, lining them up like dominoes uh, in an RV uh, configuration. Uh, some communities are now allowing tiny homes uh, on a residential lot. Uh, here's uh, some examples of tiny homes and little tiny home village clusters. Uh, and several of these in these pictures are tiny home on wheels. I bet you can't tell which ones are which. Um, but uh, I like to see a mix and match of these in a little tiny home cluster development where you have 15 
to 30 you know, units. Uh, some of them are clustered around, like on the left here, around uh, you know, a central courtyard, and that some of them are stick built, and some of them are uh, built you know, on wheels, and you mix and match them in the community. And you have common walkways and so forth. Instead of uh, uh, the zoning today, spends more time worrying about the car than worrying about people. And Dan, to go back here, I was just on a call with a gentleman today out of El Paso County in Colorado. And their um, opportunity was to be able to place a tiny home on a lot. I don't know what the zoning was, um, as long as it was stamped by an engineer. And he had bought five acres. So that told me that you know the zoning was way beyond. So you just never know what kind of zoning is out there um, and available. Obviously, if it's in a denser city area, you're probably, you know, definitely more subjugated to the type of zoning with single family and then your ADU comes into play. But I was surprised to hear. And of course, for me, I'm like, oh, where's El Paso County? Like, let me go and check on that. In addition to that, I found myself in here in San Diego, Ocean Beach. I, my jaw dropped. I saw at least a dozen of these cottage clusters because I've only seen this by, by visual, you know, on, on slide deck by Dan. I saw dozens of these in one, one block in Ocean Beach here in San Diego. So clearly this has already been done, you know, and a lot of the homes were not even as big as the home that I live in right now at 300 square feet. Uh, they were much smaller. So it is phenomenal at how these already exist. <laughs> well, what's, what's interesting is, is there's not a city in this country uh, that I can't go to and find in you know some of your older sections of town, uh, the bungalow ports like you see on the right or little village clusters. Uh, this is nothing new. This was very, I mean, remember uh, in the old days, you used to be able to buy online, uh, I shouldn't say online, through the catalog, through the Sears catalog. Remember Sears was the Amazon of my generation. Uh, you could buy a tiny home uh, through a catalog and get it delivered and you, you know, put the kit together, etc. cetera. So uh, what we're talking about is nothing new. What's happened though, is unfortunately to bring communities into the modern world, they came up with zoning and building code requirements that they have minimum lot size or minimum building size that you can't build a building less than 700 square feet to live in, you know, or you can't uh, build on a lot unless it's a half acre or a quarter acre or 6,000 square feet, you know, lot. Uh, again, zoning was a way of dividing up a community based on uh, basically uh, uh, income levels and, and really absolutely nothing to do with real housing needs. Uh, one of the things that uh, certainly working with folks around the country is configuring tiny homes and plan unit developments. They make a lot of sense to get a couple acres of land and put uh, 10, 15, 20 units in a cluster type development with uh, centralized facilities like centralized parking, centralized garbage collection, uh, centralized recreation facilities, a centralized you know, clubhouse and so forth. So a number of these are springing up around uh, the country and they're great for uh, infill or remnant parcels. Uh, there's not a city in the country that doesn't have weird remnant parcels laying around all, all over the place. They're usually left over from some public works project like building a road or a freeway or whatever. And you end up with these strange little parcels that can't be used for anything. Well, those strange little parcels, I could put five tiny homes on it and you wouldn't even know they were there. You know, uh, so they're perfect for infill type uh, uh, development. I call them plots of opportunity. <laughs> like you look at a land that's just sitting there doing nothing and there's opportunity for tiny homes. Right. Here we go. And also what's also very big and you've got a number of them back, back east, especially up in the, uh, um, uh, mountain com you know, communities, whether it's the Poconos down in Pennsylvania or uh, some of the other communities where you have tiny home resorts, you know, where literally you can go out and rent a tiny house unit for a week or a day or a long weekend 
and uh, enjoy uh, the countryside. And these are popping up all over the country and are very popular. And uh, if you're an investor, this, this is a great investor opportunity. You can make a very good return on your investment by buying one of these and air being, being it out uh, at a uh, location that people want to uh, go to, whether it's the coast or the mountains or whatever. And uh, believe it or not, since the pandemic, the pandemic has caused a building boom of tiny homes. Uh, people are, uh, our builders right now, almost all of our builders are one year out to get a tiny home from them. They are so busy uh, because people want to have the opportunity to have a unit that they can move, move someplace. They might live in a city and they don't have uh, opportunities to get out and about. Uh, so they're buying these units and uh, uh, moving them and uh, to different parts of the country or different uh, uh, locations where they can get away away for long weekends and uh, enjoy uh, the countryside or our different locale. And I know we have one panelist here. I mean, attendee here, um, Betsy. I don't know if you can add in your your tiny home village link. For some people, they're like, I'm looking for a place to park. Until I find my dream dream spot, maybe I'll find a community first, or maybe I just want to go and live in a community and I'm more flexible of where I want to live around the country. Um, we'll actually talk about that in a moment. Actually, this is perfect timing. So um, to join the tiny home movement, being a member of Thea is a great, great reason. Um, let me actually type in, let's see. I, because my screen is being shared, I'll share that link uh, so you guys can link to it. Uh, but for individual members, it's $25, nonprofit, 50, and commercial members, those are the tiny home builders, uh, anyone that provides um, supplies or equipment to the tiny home industry, that's for the $100. And what do you get for your Thea membership? This is where most people have been floored with how much they get for the $25. So much like what Dan and I are doing right now, we actually put together with Alexa Stevens um, legalized tiny homes advocacy training. So if this presentation has excited any of you to say, you know what, let's get something going on in my community here in Connecticut or around the country, then this legalized tiny homes training is a perfect training for you because Dan breaks it down into how to go and outreach to your elected officials, how to even approach and talk with them. It'll also include a lot of the slide deck that we're using here. Some of the, the mention from Luis mentioned about script, um, you know, super important for, um, you know, you to feel like you've got support to go to an elected official. And then of course, when you actually have one that you're really in communication with, we'll connect you with Dan Fitzpatrick. You've obviously got his email throughout the whole presentation uh, because that is something so important for you to become informed and then to also help your elected officials become informed. We are also doing a three-part tiny home community series and we already filmed the very first one. We really go over, Alexis does a great job where she touched on a lot of communities around the country. So you'll be able to get like, you know, in, I think she did about a 15 to 20 minute presentation. I talked a little bit more about tiny home micro villages, which are found more in California that they allow the ADU or anywhere where they allow an accessory dwelling unit in the backyard. They may also allow a junior accessory dwelling unit where it's more attached to a home, like a garage or a master bedroom, um, basement, attic, you name it. So the opportunities um, are endless with you know what you can do with now a single family zone. There's also a lot of work being done on zoning. So that three-part tiny home community series will evolve. And then we're also gonna have the live quarterly virtual webinars. So we've packed it in because really what your money is doing is to help support legalization around the US and Canada. And um, I just wanna mention Elizabeth that tiny estates in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, um, but you can definitely Google that and find the website. So tiny estates, thank you. And I think the last slide is questions. So um, people can access the chat. Is that right, Jill, for asking questions? Yeah, the chat's been open. So any questions, um, you can type them in. Um, there actually is one from Eddie um, here in uh, Connecticut, Salisbury. Are you going to show any or discuss interiors? With regards to that question, tiny home, 
Industry Association definitely focuses on legalizing tiny homes. However, myself as experienced tiny homes, I have a Go Tiny course and I'll put in my link here for people to follow me uh, because that way we will be talking about all the six different parts uh, from dream to uh, plan, to design, to build, to park, to live. It's really a comprehensive approach to going tiny. Um, and I will include the link here to that course. Uh, um, basically, when it, as it comes to interiors, whatever you can dream, you can build. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen uh, tiny homes uh, built. Uh, there was even one built, a uh, friend of mine uh, built uh, one, he builds about a hundred a year. He built one for a, cl a client who has a pet iguana. So he even has a great big, huge iguana cage in the living room. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, units built with basic uh, kitchens and I've seen them with gra granite countertops. And I've seen bathrooms with uh, walk-in showers and cloth foot tubs in the same bathroom. So, you know, whatever you, you know, you dream, uh, you can put in a, uh, a tiny home, just on a smaller scale. Absolutely, I have a steam room bathtub in my tiny home and it has speakers in it. Just saying, I, my big thing was if I wanted to downsize my space, I wanted to upsize the luxury. So we have a loft, we have um, uh, quartz countertops, um, undermount sink, most people respond to, or at least when they see our tiny home, we've had over 10,000 people visit our tiny home here, uh, that our kitchen's bigger than most kitchens, uh, you know, not compared to like a 2,000 square foot home, but in regards to maybe smaller homes, because my husband's a chef, and we wanted to make that very much a must-have. So when you focus on interiors, it really comes down to how do you use the space? Are you focused more in an office? Do you want to use your kitchen more? Um, you know, if it's all of the above, then there's some adjustment you'll have to make based on how big your size of your home is, which also relates to how big of budget you have. These are all connected. Many, uh, many of the tiny homes now uh, uh, have don't have uh, a typical uh, oven and cooktop. They have some drawers where you store uh, the toaster oven or a, um, what's the cooktop, um, the induction, induction you know, yeah. cooktop or a crock pot and it has a microwave. So you just take out of the drawer, which unit you wanna plug in, you put it on the counter and that's your, that's your cooking facility for, uh, of the day. And I just saw another link, you know, a great way to engage your communities is to have a tiny home visit your site at your libraries. I think that's an amazing thing. Let's do a library tour of Connecticut, right? With a, our tiny home. I wish I could say yes to that. I'd be a little nervous of the bridges back in the East Coast. I have heard they're a little shorter than I'm familiar with. We kind of can clear 15 feet. Um, we did get under a 1311. That was the, the shortest we'll go. But a great way to see tiny homes is to come and visit festivals. Now, the ones I just put in the chat are the ones at least on the East Coast that are coming up um, at the end of this month, if anyone wants to go to Sarasota and join me there, or in January, Tampa, Florida, and you can go to Great American Tiny House Show. Um, I'm not, you know, a lot of the tiny house festivals are coming back online. They're Colorado is having two in the month of July as well. Um, so if anyone wants more of that, you can email me. Um, I'll be putting that out on my newsletter I send out twice a month. Or, uh, follow there, the, oh, sorry, or, follow uh, us on uh, Facebook as well on Tiny Home Industry Association. Uh, there in New England, one of a, a big builder of tiny homes is Corinne up in the tiny home of Maine. And I know she builds units that she delivers all over New England. So um, any of you that uh, she may be delivering something down in your area, if you want, to, if she can get permission from the client, she'll park it out in front of your library for a day. Absolutely. We have a number of people up in uh, the different areas of that country and yeah, building great, amazing tiny homes. Any other, other questions? Questions? Oh, there you go. Elizabeth said, attend a virtual tiny house conference. There's a global one coming up in October. Yes, that's the tinyhouse.com 
They host those. I've been a speaker there every one since they've launched. So that's a great way on, um, you know, but nothing like seeing it to believe it. Dan, um, it, Dan, is it Tiny Homes of Maine, uh, Corinne Watson? Yes. Okay, I found it. I'll, I'll put the site up. Tiny she's, a, she's a great lady. She, she and I worked together for over two years and she was able to, she's become quite a lobbyist. She was able to get tiny homes approved legally for the entire state of Maine. Wow. And now just got it approved uh, that they uh, are permissible or pretty much mandated that all local municipalities uh, must, uh, you know, allow tiny homes now. So, okay. uh, so she's, she's extremely busy. She's almost a year out herself, so. Wow. There's also a number of builders up in uh, Canada. So, you know, the good thing is tiny homes can travel on the road. So um, upstate tiny homes, you know, if Brittany's still doing her thing. I'm looking on Google right now. I'm gonna... I haven't, I haven't heard from her for two years. Okay, so we do, they still have a website. So I'm gonna put there up in New York. Um, so they're probably um, based on where you're at, a little bit closer. There we go. Just looking in the different areas. There's yeah, quite a few, uh, quite a few builders in Pennsylvania, spe especially in the Lancaster area. You know, the Amish country. There's a number of uh, builders in Pennsylvania. And one thing um, to note, I'm just going to share a screen really quick. I want some people to get familiarized with um, what we are seeing in terms of. You saw my tiny home, which is Dan mentions eight and a half wide. When you see homes like this, these are much bigger chassis. These are your RV park model. Um, they can be in the 14 to 15 feet wide. Just to show you some examples, this one right here, uh, they call the Glenwood. That's more of your, you know, tiny home where it's eight and a half wide. The Echo right here is more of that park model, wider where they're adding on decks. These are less likely once they get landed to move. Um, these ones that are smaller are more likely to be able to be portable. All of them, of course, arrive there on wheels so they can be moved. Um, as you can see, this one's a really good example of that. What, what, what's interesting now is um, almost 50% of the tiny homes built by the commercial builders are 10 feet wide uh, because they're mainly used for people that are only going to move them on occasion, like every four or five years. And so you might as well get the extra two feet of space because you're basically, you know, you're basically only taking it to put in a backyard and live in it for four or five years. And then you may move it to make it your mountain cabin or your uh, ocean getaway. And um, so uh, again, most, most of the uh, movable tiny home units are eight and a half feet to 10 feet. Very few go over uh, that unless they're the full blown park models, uh, which can go up to uh, what I think is a 14 and a half feet. And a lot of people do ask, you know, how is it moved? And then I often ask, are you moving it? And they're like, no, I'm not driving that thing. I'm like, okay, so a professional will likely be hired to move your tiny home. Even ones that are eight and a half wide and you know, 35, 40 feet long, um, if you've never driven a fifth wheel in town or on freeways, you will likely be hiring someone. If it is a 10 foot wide, then they're gonna get permits for that. And, you know, it's the permit fee is nominal compared to the professional fee for it to be driven. It all depends on how far it's being driven and where it's coming from. And as uh, Betsy's perfect example, been her single level home for over two years, and has moved it three times to date. Versus me, where I've moved ours, I can't count. <laughs> and what in-ground septic facilities do these tiny homes require? Um, interesting note, you mentioned, Robert, septic. It all depends on if you are gonna be in an area where there is a septic system um, versus a city sewer. Dan, you might be able to chat more about that. Well, basically what a municipality is going to do is they're going to treat it a movable tiny house just like any other house is if there's municipal water or sewer available, they're going to want you to hook up to it. Um, uh, and if you're out in a rural area and the rural area requires um, a septic system, you're going to have to put in a septic system. 
Now, with that said, is some folks say, well, I have a composting toilet. Yes, that takes care of uh, the toilet, but most your environmental health departments around the country still want you to do something with the gray water, especially the water that comes out of your sink where you're washing poultry or meat or whatever. They don't want that running down you know, the street or the gutter or around your you know, property. So they'll want some kind of a treatment system for it. So early on, it's best to try to work with your local uh, city uh, or county health department and find out what they uh, will or will not accept. And Dan, here's another question about seeing models that can be removed from the trailer so that the trailer can be repurposed for another tiny home. Um, I'll, I'll answer my quick thing and then Dan will definitely have another insight to that. You're gonna see shows, especially in New Zealand, where they're gonna like take the whole home off this trailer. The home is still gonna be built with support, just like you would have to have a foundation. You're gonna to have to have some beam support, all of that, because everything stacking on top of that home is based off that support. However, there are unique ways to be able to separate uh, the axles and the tires is more so what's being removed from the trailer. Um, Dan, what's your insight on that one? Well, basically what they're talking about is what is how they build manufactured housing. It's, it's built on a, a basically a carrier to move it to a site. And it's only built quality wise to get it to a site, not to drag it all over you know, the country. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, the unit is, be, is built to not to be to stay on wheels, it's built to be lifted off and put on piers. And then the axles and the wheels and the basic carrier goes away to you know use uh, for another uh, an, another unit down the line. So a a true movable tiny house is the carriage and the wheels and the axles are all very much integrated because that's why it's movable. That on a, on any given day you can jack it up, uh, pull the piers out from under, put the wheels on, unless, unless the wheels are already there, and you can be down the road in a couple hours. Uh, so there's several different ways of handling that, and it all depends on what your end use for your unit is. You can buy them any, any, I call it all of the above, pick one. And just to add to Carla's question about, you know, first floor bedrooms. So I always tell everyone, as they came into our tiny home with the loft and we have a crawl in closet and with a laundry at the back of it, they're like, are you crazy? You know, for a lot of people, like, I love it. It's We call this the climber's house. So not quite what I'll be doing in, you know, in other years. Hopefully I can do it for as long as I possibly can. But they're highly customizable. You know, if you are in the budget, and I'm about to get to this next question that Nancy posed, um, if you are in the budget of having what you want and having your bedroom on the floor, you might have a loft, but it might be for your grandkids or other people or even storage up there. It all depends if... If having a bedroom is where you want it to be on the floor, you know, just because you've seen some people make first floor bedrooms, I think any builder that does custom tiny homes can do a, a bedroom on the floor. Actually adding the loft adds more cost because you're adding more structural, uh, you know, they have to build that loft into there to obviously carry the weight. What, so, you, what, you're, what you will find is, is that uh, because us baby boomers are such a prominent, predominant buyer of tiny houses, you know, folks my age don't want to crawl up and down that loft. Uh, so a good number of your professional tiny home builders have excellent models for uh, downstairs bedrooms that will accommodate a king or queen size, you know, bed and an adjoining uh, bathroom, shower, you know, facilities, etc., all on one floor. And if it's big enough, they'll put in a, a loft. It could be a smaller loft or a bigger loft. Again, when the grandkids come to visit, uh, you know, it's a, you know, perfect, you know, space or most of the time they're using it for storage. Uh, but, uh, you know, when the kids come to visit or whatever, they have a place that they can crawl up in the loft. But uh, folks my age don't want to crawl in a loft. <laughs> and we're still doing it. I'm, I'm still 50. So I like that, that opportunity because now I can have a bathroom down below and then have this little space that could obviously be a second loft room, 
but since it's just my husband and myself, it's the closet and the back and the washer combo dryer is definitely in the back there. And we have to crawl in the back because I didn't want to put laundry at, it wasn't my highest um, essential. I didn't want to like take over precious kitchen space or bathroom space. But if you're talking to my friend with a family of six, oh yeah, she's got the big size washer dryer going on in her home um, and they have a 40 foot home. So I wanted to also share my screen really quickly because there's a question that got posed about pricing and pricing is a big thing. So I, this was not recently um, and don't try to see all of it, but I will share with you. Um, I did a eight by 20, eight by 22. I have all different kinds of tiny homes. Um, you'll see California Tiny House has a, homes has a, a series of models. I compared them to like really high end. Let me just show you, for example, here's on the eight, eight by 20 category. Uh, you'll get something in the 68,000 all the way down to the 40,000. So the big answer, of course, is it depends, right? What kind of materials you're putting in there. But on average, as I scrolled through the whole thing, you're, you know, I came up with about $350 a square foot. Our home with solar, with all the bells and whistles is about 330 per square foot. But if you're gonna do more of your basic rental uh, materials, it could definitely go less. If your roof lines are very simple, either gable roof or um, shed roof, that's gonna have an impact. Loft, no loft, bathtub, shower, all of those things start adding into it. And then on top of it, we do have the reality that prices across the board in the building world, wood, steel, electrical, you name it, have all gone up not just by half but by like more than half like three times yeah and the the biggest Daniel biggest Smith problem is wood <laughs> yeah trying to try to go go down the home depot and try to buy wood right now i mean you know my god you're paying 100 bucks for a sheet of uh plywood the materials for a typical tiny house just the materials is a minimum of about thirty five thousand dollars for materials so anyone that says they're building a tiny house for like thirty-five or forty thousand uh, dollars is, trust me, they're not. They're not building much. Uh, just a trailer alone, a good good quality trailer, is uh, six to ten thousand dollars depending on the size. Yes, and ours was just so you know a gooseneck. Which when you get into the gooseneck, it's more for traveling, um, articulation with the truck, and all of that. It's much easier. Usually the ones that are in the 30 feet or more are go in the gooseneck. It does not have to be. Bumper pulls the other option where it attaches right to the truck. Uh, but those can be, I think it was uh, 10,000 for our trailer alone. And that was 17, 2017. So Basic, basically your trailer is 10% of your build. Yeah. But the nice part is you're building on a brand new foundation. So think of you know, and the other thing is you're also building to withstand earthquake and hurricane conditions. Normal houses that get built on foundation do not. In fact, it was really funny when someone's like, how does this hold up in an earthquake? And I, I just thought much better than any other house that's built even on foundation because what's going on with the axles, if you do leave them on, they're taking up the, the shock, right? They're handling any kind of shock absorption. Here in California, obviously, we're more aware of earthquakes than other places. So um, also, there was another question here. I'm just going to show an image of a loft bedroom um, reversed, bedroom on the bottom that you might crawl into and out of, and then step up to the stairs to the sitting room or whatever. So that's the reversal image. All right, is it easier? There was a question. There was a question about, is it easier to have a shipping container or, a, or build from scratch or tiny home? And, uh, I, you know, my feeling is, is that, you know, shipping containers, I've seen some excellent shipping containers uh, turned into, you know, tiny homes. But remember, even with a shipping container, uh, you're building a house, a, you know, a typical two by four house within the shipping container. The shipping container is basically only saving you the cost of the exterior. Everything else has to be built inside anyway. Uh, so it's six of one, half dozen of the other, depending on how you like uh, uh, containers. Uh, and, you know, I've seen some nice container communities where they're actually stacked on top of each other, where you're going to have two-story 
you know, units or a number of different uh, configurations. So there's pros and cons of each. And what's funny, just to show you a little bit about our home, a lot of people ask us, just kind of makes me laugh, was this a shipping container that you converted? We're like, no, often because they see what, what they're seeing is standing seam roof. You will, I'll go online right now. Oh no, I hope I don't have too many tabs. Oh no, not the ones with all the tabs. Yep, there's me, that's my world. So if I say tiny homes, tiny homes, you will, rarely see oops there we go that's where you find us on the tiny home industry tiny homes you will commonly find that tiny homes have standing seam roof time and time again let me get to my images and when i say standing seam roof you will often find homes that are much bigger not have standing seam roof because they're really expensive to do a standing seam roof for a bigger home but these roofs are like lifetime roofs um, someone said they're 50 year, I'm 50, so they're my lifetime. But you will often find a standing seam roof on, there it is, there's the standing seam again and again. That's it's, what kind of makes people think that it might be a shipping container, but it is yeah, not. It's not, it's not coming up on your show. Oh, it's not? This, no, no. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Anyway, the, um, the, uh, most of the tiny homes are not built with uh, built with cedar shingle roofs or asphalt type roofs because, quite frankly, when you're driving down the highway, they blow off. Uh, they're they're built with you know usually interlocking steel uh, you know roofs that you know as Lindsay said will last for last for a lifetime. And Robert, I'm going to give you a link to, I'm actually doing a three-day tiny home challenge um, coming up at the end of this month. So um, we'll be doing all that talk about interiors uh, as a whole section on that. I'm um, also in the Go Tiny course. So uh, Jill, interiors, I think interiors, uh, Jill has a question. Okay. Oh, no, there was a question earlier on um, a few minutes ago. I missed it by Allison um, regarding land. Do you rent okay. the land once you move it to a site or do you pay a monthly fee? How does that work? I can the answer. answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. all of the above. You can you can buy land. Uh, you can rent land. You can lease land. Uh, you know, you can go to a park like a campground park and park it where you're paying so much per night or a weekly or monthly rate. Uh, Lindsay's doing that, you know, right now or if you have a friend that has a, a backyard or someplace where you can park it and, and put it, uh, you know, have at it. But uh, there's any number of different configurations for the land. And what I want to make sure everyone's aware of, what you need in your home. So, for example, when our, because we have a, a, what they call a composting toilet is not a composting toilet. Just to be clear, it takes one year for a human compost to do its thing. It is a collection of solids and separation of the, of the liquid. That's what's the unique feature about those type of toilets. The land that we parked on that was called, I call under the radar, as in we didn't have permits, but we parked there for a good six months. No one complained and we were happily there. We could get water to the home and we had a 20 amp circuit, but we had no sewer line. However, because of our composting toilet, we were running a gray water out. Like Dan mentioned, that would be not acceptable if that was something that Health and Human Services or the county was able to see us there. Are lots of people living that way? Yes, in the tiny home world. However, when I go to an RV park, full hookups, here at the place where I'm paying $1,000 a month in San Diego, very clear, we were paying $500 a month in um, Sebastopol, and that was a pretty good deal. Everywhere I was going was like 800 a month, 1,000. Heck, I've even heard of $2,000 a month in RV parks, which we obviously did not partake in. Um, so it's a full range. I've also heard of people in the $200 range. Uh, maybe Betsy can share, you know, if there's something what they're charging at tiny estates. It's the whole gamut as to where you're living, um, what services you need for your home, because that will determine what utilities or toilets or things that you put in your home. Um, if you need a gas line, if you're going to run gas, you're probably going to use propane that's already portable on or attached to your home. So those are just some ideas there. Any other questions? Florida is, is, has subsidized fees for lots. Oh, great. 
Wonderful. And Jan, and Jan or Jan, do the building codes need to apply to tiny homes on wheels and not a foundation? It was a bit unclear about during this discussion. All right, so Basically. building codes, Jan. Basically, you have different codes. Uh, tiny, a tiny house on foundations is built. You're built to the same building code as for your, your main house. A typical house, whether it's a 3,000 square foot house or a 400 square foot house, is built in general in most states, most communities built to the what's known as the 2018 International Residential Building Code. And that's what you build to. And you get your, you get your um, permits from your local uh, building uh, officials and they inspect it as it's being built. And when it's done, they give you a certificate of occupancy. A movable tiny house is built in a factory or you're building it you know, for yourself. And because they're on wheels, they're built to what we refer to as the ANSI standards, A-N-S-I, the American National Standards Institute standards. And it's basically ANSI 11.9.5 section of the code. And you're building it to the code, and that's basically the code that builds the park model, you know, RVs. Uh, even though they're built to a much higher standard than a park model RV, that's the basic code. And the inspections that are done are done by third parties to make sure you are in compliance with the ANSI 1195 uh, codes. So it's a totally different code uh, configuration than you know, a stick built on foundation house, which is covered by the International Residential Code. And the companies that certify to those codes we mentioned earlier, uh, two of our tiny home industry association members also offering DIY programs are Pacific West and NOAA to so take it one more step. And each, whatever your builder is, they will be building to that code. If you're gonna do a hybrid where you can do you can order a kit, you can, you can order a shell, um, and you can finish out the interior yourself. That would be still under the DIY because you're touching a significant part of it, um, but it most likely will start with a builder first. Or you can have a builder do it all of it, or you can do 100% of it. So, so there's a lot of different directions, and you can still have each one of those types certified. We're big on certification here because it helps our industry. The last thing we want to hear is someone building something and out of code and something burned up and you know fell apart on the freeway that does not do well for this industry even though i understand there's a lot of cost involved that a lot of people you know unfortunately like on youtube whatever hey i built my home for twenty thousand. if you're going to it's just time or money right if you've got the skill and the time you're going to pay less money if you have less skill and the and more money then and you know, in less time, then you're going to pay for someone else to build it. So, right. And and remember, uh, you know, I, I I see these shows where people say we built our tiny house for twenty thousand. I know folks that have done a do-it-yourself house using reclaimed wood, etc. I also know the same folks have termites in their house. Uh, uh, Lindsay and I have a very good friend who had to have their house tented <laughs> and fumigated because the reclaimed wood they use had termites. Um, and, uh, and quite yeah, frankly, quite frankly, you, you gotta be very, very careful. Uh, you know, even the windows, you don't want single pane, pane windows that uh, are dangerous, especially going down the highway, someone falls in and, you know, gets yeah. cut and so forth. You need double paned, you know, residential grade windows. You, as I said earlier, even for a small, tiny house, you, it's impossible to buy the material you need for a typical tiny house for less than $35,000. That's no labor, that's no nothing. That's just a, a, a pile of, of lumber and pieces that you pick up at Home Depot. Absolutely. Um, the interesting thing is we built a lot with inter internally. We did a lot of stuff with pallet wood but it, pallet wood is not what we would use for a structural. Like there's there's a point where, oh, I can, you know, get these things for free or you can also spend a lot of time, you know, sanding or whatever. So it's time and labor, right? You can also find beautiful um, structural, you know, I wouldn't say structural, but more like finished pieces 
uh, you know, reclaimed redwood from barns, you name it, those kind of things are very well, um, you know, received, but yeah, you've really got to watch, you know, the money you save could be the nightmare down the road. And you've got to be very careful when, when you're building these things is, uh, uh, the last thing you want is not have, having your appliances properly vented. You're going to just kill yourself. Um, yeah. You know, and and also, you know, you got to you got to make sure that you're putting the insulation in. Um, you you would certainly put higher degrees of insulation there in New England than we could get away with in the coastal communities of California. Uh, you know, you got to you got to you got to put in the house wrap and everything else that uh, it properly allows the house to breathe. Because one of the big problems with smaller units in general is uh, you got to make sure that you're dehumidifying uh, the units or otherwise you're going to get mold. So there's a lot of, lot of things that go into properly designing uh, a home that you're actually going to be able to live in. And I, you know, I tell everyone this product and I realize we, we need to call them to become a member of Thea, but the Lunos is a um, heat recovery ventilation system that requires or that keeps circulating fresh air, but the energy, the, the heat or the cool inside your home, depending on the heat or the cooled outside, it actually does this magical system inside the unit where the stale air, you know, gets exchanged for clean but the heat or the cold stays in. So it's, it's pretty phenomenal. I wrote that, I put that in the link on, um, you know, oftentimes you will become the educator of your builder if they don't know it. it. If it's your home and it's a custom home, you're the one that's gonna need to specify that. Um, for people that wanna go off grid, this is a big interest. Uh, you know, oftentimes we recommend, cause I'm an off grid specialist, recommend still the anything you heat with air, water, or food that you do on propane or off solar, especially if you're looking at New England, unless you want to run a generator also in hybrid or tandem with the solar system. So those are all the different things. Um, oh, but um, um, I, I guess my question is, um, you've got your builder and you've got to pick out where you live, but say Anybody listening to this evening, they're in Connecticut, they want to stay in Connecticut. What's the first thing they do? They've got to go to their planning department in their town. Right. Dan. You gotta find you gotta find a place where you can legally, you know, park it and live in it. Uh, now right. you most many times you could probably live in or rent a space in a local campground or RV park. And many times I don't know what the laws are in uh, Connecticut, but many times they allow you to only live there a certain number of days per year. Right. You know, so, so, you know, I've I've seen campgrounds where they'll allow you to be there 90 days, and then you got to move to another campground because the state law allows it to only be 90 days at a at a time. Right. Uh, then there's campgrounds that uh, permit extended stay. Mm -hmm. If you want something in your backyard, you need to uh, work with your uh, local planning staff and city council members and um, get to change the laws. Usually back east, you got, you got, to, you got to change two laws. Yeah. First, you got to allow an accessory dwelling unit to be built in the backyard. Right. And then number two is you need to allow a tiny home, whether it's on wheels or stick built, to be built in the backyard. So you got a two-step uh, process. Um, and if you want to learn how to do that, how to talk to your elected officials, uh, our Tiny Home Industry Association has webinars, which I teach, on a three-part series on how to deal with your local government officials to get that done. Great. I'm actually just getting um, the Living Tiny Legally is one of, uh, we're very proud to have also on our board, uh, Alexis and Christian. And they created Living Tiny Legally, which features Dan. Actually, I met Dan through a YouTube uh, show before I actually saw him ever in person. So uh, for me, I'm quite honored to have him be my mentor, friend, and share the stage here. Uh, but I'm gonna put that in the link. That's a really good one to kind of see what other communities have done. And that was a while ago. There's actually part two, and I think they're working on part three, so. Any other questions for this tiny home? Big idea today. 
That was great. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully we gave you enough information. There's a big community. Join us. We'd love to have you there because we do a lot with our um, quarterly outreach. We're going to be at the events, the Great American Tiny House shows. Also put that link out there. Um, uh, they're going to have them all over the country. I wish they had them right in Connecticut. But, you know, actually having a show in your area would be amazing because that is how a lot of places around the country happen to have a lot of these tiny home villages now because there's been festivals at their area for a number of years like Colorado has been going on for you know almost a decade so you know having shows like that and actually Haig with the Great American Tiny House show um, might just be interested in doing something there really has not been any shows up in New England have you heard of any Dan? Uh, they've done them in the past and uh I know Haig and others are looking at some opportunities to uh, Pennsylvania or uh, New England, but as you, we all know, the pandemic certainly put everyone behind the, uh, the eight ball and the folks are now starting to get out and uh, putting on the uh, uh, festivals again. Uh, just back to one point about talking to your elected officials. Don't worry about you know, doing the details. The key is, is to find tiny, friendly elected officials. Then call me, you know, say, look, I've talked to the mayor of so-and-so and they're tiny, friendly. They want to do something, but they don't know how to do it. Well, fine. That's all I need. All I need to know is, is that you found someone that is tiny, friendly, a friendly elected official to talk to, and then set up a Zoom call and uh, I do Zoom calls all over the country and educate elected officials and their staff on how to write ordinances uh, to permit uh, tiny homes. I've done it for, uh, what is it, Great, Great Barrington, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, uh, you know, you name it. I'm doing it for South Lake Tahoe right now, which is uh, quite an interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I want to. I was, we definitely want to get South Lake Tahoe. South Lake Tahoe is one of the most beautiful spots in the world. Yes, and but I'm they get a lot. They get I'm, a lot of snow, so I'm having to put slope roofs and a lot of insulation in in that ordinance. Yes, I'm actually putting a step step one through four as to like what you do. You know, before you're actually connecting Dan to an elected official is exactly what I did in my hometown of Mendocino County, Northern California, where I was working with the local um, mayor who then became the local county supervisor and you know, made sure to bring her on. So I did all the follow-up work and then basically, you know, made the connection, brought her in front of Dan because Dan's already done this with so many cities and counties. Don't make yourself be the expert on that because you'll never catch up to Dan. He's got 30 plus years and all of these others, let him be the, the heavy guns, as he likes to call it, you know, to bring you what you need to your community. Yeah. All right. So it all starts with become a member. Thank you so much for the support of the Tiny Home Industry Association for us to help legalize tiny across the U.S. and Canada. Um, we've been busy doing that. And uh, the Zoom world has definitely helped to get the word out. So thank you, Jill. And thank you to all the libraries. We'll also be speaking, I think, next month. Um, and I'm going to get up the library. So I'm blinking my brain here. What's that? Uh, let's see. With West Hartford Public Library on August Ooh. 4th. From oh, great. 30 to 4 30 our time that means 6 30 your time so oh, great great you know, great. if you like you know if something got missed on this time we'll be doing this it might be a very similar presentation but we might have different questions so yeah some libraries said that they might reach out to you so that was good good to great. do another one and That's this can great. never be shared enough you know oftentimes you know hearing this again and again and again right dan you even talk to officials again and again oh yeah i mean it's uh but one thing you'll find out about elected officials is they, they don't necessarily like to be the first to do something. And the good news is, is we have many examples around the country where I can say, well, you know, uh, for example, Raleigh, North, uh, North Carolina or uh, Atlanta, Georgia. 
I immediately, immediately introduced them to the staff I worked with in Oakland, California, Los Angeles, California, uh, San Jose, California. In other words, equal size cities that they were able to all talk planner to planner about how they did it. And that's worth its weight in gold to make those introductions to get things done. Cool. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you everyone. That, that was fascinating. And um, thanks everyone for joining us. It was a nice group this evening and thanks for supporting your public libraries. Thanks, Lindsay. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, bye-bye.